Hi there. Uh, my name is Eva Gelperin. I am the Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I am going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that EFF does, the work that I have done uh, about privacy and security all over the world, and how you can do a little bit of that work yourself. So uh, usually I would be joining you in, uh, in Kiev, but we are now in year two of the plague. So I am doing this uh, keynote from the comfort of my own home, not even the EFF office. Uh, I have put on a festive gown, um, but because we're doing this, this talk from inside of my house, I am also wearing fuzzy slippers. Uh, so normally what I would do when, uh, when I start a keynote is uh, look out over the audience and ask everybody uh, how many people here uh, know what EFF is. So right now I'm just going to pretend that I have asked you how many people here know what EFF is and that some of you raised your hands and some of you knew and some of you did not know. Uh, and then I usually look relieved and I go, ah, good, I don't have to do a long explanation. And then I, I launch into sort of a medium-sized explanation of what EFF is and what we do. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a digital civil liberties organization. Uh, we make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. And uh, in order to do this, we have uh, teams of lawyers, uh, activists all over the world, and technologists. And we sort of combine to fold a to form a Voltron, doing all kinds of interesting work in order to, uh, in order to help to maintain people's civil liberties. Um, I have worked at EFF uh, for 14 years now, since, uh, since 2007. And uh, as a result, I have had the opportunity to work at EFF through a lot of, of really interesting times and in a bunch of really interesting positions. Um, for example, when I started at EFF, uh, we were in the middle of our lawsuit against AT&T for their part in uh, the uh, US uh, government's warrantless wiretapping program. Uh, where they were installing secret rooms in, uh, in telcos and simply copying over all of, the, uh, all of the data that was going through there and using it to spy on, um, on Americans and also people all over the world. And the only reason that people uh, in the U.S. were particularly bent out of shape about uh, spying on Americans is that the NSA is specifically forbidden from spying on the communications of Americans. Uh, the NSA argued that they were not spying on the communications, they were merely copying the communications for possible spying later. Uh, and that court case lasted for many years and uh, it was actually the reason why Snowden uh, first uh, published the, the first of his revelations uh, from inside of the NSA, and the very first thing that Snowden published was, a, uh, was an order from the NSA to Verizon, which gave rise to EFF's uh, case against, uh, directly against the government. Uh, and that was ongoing for many years. One of the things that, uh, that you learn about impact litigation, uh, that thing where you have lawyers who file cases that they think are going to really make a difference um, to the law for everybody, impacting not just the people who are the plaintiffs or the defendants in the case, um, but all kinds of other people, uh, is uh, that the wheels of justice move very, very slowly. Uh, there was a copyright case that, uh, that EFF refers to as the dancing baby case um, because it involved a baby dancing on YouTube to, I think, something like 14 seconds of Prince's Let's Go Crazy. And that copyright case with Universal lasted so long that uh, I think that baby was approaching middle school by the time it settled. So uh, we, have, we have these sort of three different kinds of people. We have, uh, we have lawyers who do, who do impact litigation, uh, and we have activists. We have uh, activists all over the world because sometimes the answer to a uh, you know, digital civil liberties problem is that people have to get out in the streets uh, or people have to sign a petition 
uh, or people need to make their voices heard about a particular issue. That's, that's why we have activists. Um, again, one of the sort of early things that EFF did uh, that you might be aware of was that we uh, once rented a uh, dirigible from Greenpeace and flew it over the NSA's uh, secret um, data center in, uh, in Utah just to let them know what it felt like to be spied on. Uh, so we do all kinds of things like that. And finally, uh, we have technologists. We have, uh, we have teams of hackers, and our technologists work on two kinds of things. Um, the first is uh, that we work on a series of software projects. So we have people who work on um, some things that you may have heard of, uh, such as uh, CertBot. So if you've ever got a free SSL certificate, you're welcome. Uh, we also built a um, web extension called HTTPS Everywhere uh, back before the web was largely, uh, was largely encrypted that made sure that if you were going to a website and uh, it supported HTTPS that you would go to the HTTPS version of the site by default. Uh, we have um, other tools uh, including a, a tool to let you see whether or not uh, you are um, your your identity is being used uh, by by Google and linked to other identities uh, on on uh, Flock, which is uh, sort of their new way of, of grouping people together, uh, which is super creepy. Uh, and then finally, we have the the little corner of EFF that I work in. Uh, I work in EFF's Threat Lab, and Threat Lab is made up uh, entirely of security researchers. And our job is uh, to sort of expand people's ideas about cybersecurity, because often when we think about cybersecurity, uh, especially in, uh, in academia and uh, sort of in information security, uh, we think about security for corporations and we think about security for governments. And that leaves, uh, that leaves a lot out. That leaves out security for, uh, for individuals. It leaves out security for journalists and activists, for dissidents, for uh, people in domestic abuse situations, for you know, people who are being harassed online. Uh, and so the, the work of Threat Lab is really to take uh, all of these conversations about privacy and security, especially digital privacy and security, that have been pushed out to the margins as, uh, as corner cases and as special cases, uh, and really move them to the center. And the, the thesis of our work is that if you, uh, if you start with securing governments and uh, corporations, if you start by securing people in power, uh, you will never get around to securing uh, the people without power, uh, to securing the people on the margins, the people without money, the people without a voice. But if you start uh, by building tools that are secure to use uh, and that are safe to use for the marginalized, that you will automatically build tools that are also safe uh, for people who are you know, sort of at the center of conversations and people who are already in power. So that's, uh, that's what we do. Um, I can talk a little bit about how we got there. Uh, I started out at EFF I, as a answering the phone. I was on my way to law school and I took a job before starting law school and somehow never quite left. Uh, but my job at the, in 2007 was to answer the phone and do legal intake. So people would call me up and they would uh, describe their legal problem. And then I had to figure out whether or not this was the kind of case that, uh, that EFF might take, or this was the, the sort of situation that EFF might blog about or uh, write a, a petition about uh, or an angry letter about. So uh, I had to get very good at recognizing all of EFF's issues very quickly. 
Uh, this was also, again, at the, at the height of the NSA case. And so there were a lot of people who uh, were calling me to tell me that, uh, that they were being spied on, uh, who actually just had mental health problems. And so I had to learn a, uh, a tremendous amount of empathy and patience. Um, not everybody who called us uh, really had a, you know, a digital security problem or a case that EFF could take. Uh, but every single one of those people deserved to be taken seriously and deserved to be heard and deserved to be sent to, uh, to resources that could help them, even if that resource is, uh, is not necessarily my organization. So I did that for a while. Uh, and then after a, a few years of legal intake, I moved into uh, the activism team and I did a bunch of work on, uh, on internet censorship. And at the time, uh, sort of the, the big issue in internet censorship uh, was uh, that uh, Facebook had uh, instituted a real names policy. So uh, up until then, I don't know how many of you are, uh, are old enough to remember uh, an internet where it was normal for people not to use their real names. Uh, it was considered a little weird for people to use their real names online. Almost everybody used some sort of handle on, you know, on MySpace and Friendster and Tribe uh, and uh, a lot of these sort of uh, early social networks. And uh, Facebook, because it was based around the sort of uh, college idea of a Facebook where everybody knows everybody else, uh, was really hung up on the notion that, uh, that everybody should use their real names. Uh, and they started taking down accounts that did not look like they were real um, or names that they felt didn't look particularly real. And I'm sure you can already see the problem with this, which is that um, all kinds of people have names that um, by the standards of some you know, white guy working in Santa Clara for Facebook look fake. Um, there, uh, it, is, it is not common uh, across the world, especially once you have a billion accounts uh, for people's names to, uh, to have two parts, for the, uh, for the last name to be second, uh, for, their, for there to only be two names, um, for you know, names to be you know, symbols. This is, this is also a thing that happens. Um, lots of people use uh, pseudonyms or uh, you know, stage names by which, uh, especially if they're performers, um, by which they are known better. And a lot of people don't even know their real names. Uh, and that is incredibly common. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, for example, was not born Marilyn Monroe. Her original name is Norma Jean. Uh, and if somebody had made her be Norma Jean on Facebook, nobody would have known that they were looking at Marilyn Monroe's account. So uh, this was a very serious problem. Um, and it was a big problem for, uh, for people who were not using their real names for a variety of other reasons. Uh, people were not using their real names because they were doing activism and they didn't want their activism to be linked to, uh, to their jobs or to their real identity. Sometimes people worked as school teachers or they were uh, pastors in a church um, and they wanted to separate their, uh, their work identity from the uh, identity that did other things. And this is normal. The idea that we should all have the same identity that is the same to everybody uh, is, uh, is actually fairly new and a little bit crazy. Uh, we are different people at a conference online than we are at work, than we are to our parents, than we are at school, than we are at church, than we are at the nightclub, than we are at the bar. And that is perfectly normal and they don't all have to exist together and they definitely don't all have to hang out with one another and know about each other. Um, so there were all kinds of ways in which uh, Facebook's real names policy was a very serious problem. And uh, I spent a lot of time yelling at them. Uh, while I was yelling at Facebook, the Arab Spring started. 
And uh, at the time, the internet was largely uh, still unencrypted, so people were sending their, uh, their web traffic over straight HTTP. And uh, this meant that if you were a government and you ran a telco, uh, it was actually really easy to spy on all of the traffic. Um, at the time, Facebook had just started moving some things to HTTPS. Uh, same with Twitter, same with Google. And the, uh, the common thinking was that HTTPS was for logins and it was for, uh, for credit card information because otherwise who would buy things online? Um, but that it was not for everything else because the uh, contents of your chats and the photos that you send and the uh, specific URLs that you're going to, that stuff's not private. That stuff won't give away you know, important information about who you are or what you're doing. Surely that will be fine. So I know all of you can, can poke holes in this argument really uh, quite easily. So there we were, uh, and it was the beginning of the Arab Spring, and the uh, Assad government had uh, gotten this reputation in the United States as uh, sort of a, as a, a liberal government. Uh, Assad was described as the father of the Syrian internet, and the reason for this was that he had sort of uh, throttled back uh, the um, censorship and the blocking of, uh, of social media inside of, uh, inside of Syria. But it turned out that the reason that he was doing this was so that he could spy on, uh, on people's traffic. And the way that it turned out the Syrian government was doing this uh, was by uh, faking SSL certificates and man in the middling all of the traffic. Uh, so again, we had to go and yell at the companies and uh, convince them that what they really needed to do was to implement uh, HTTPS uh, for everything, SSL by default. Uh, and uh, we got a lot of pushback on that. We got a lot of pushback basically saying that, again, these are edge cases. These are just activists. It's just people in Syria. It's just people in Tunisia. Uh, and what we started to see was that as more and more governments became interested in man in the middling um, this sort of traffic, the more important it became uh, for everything to go out over, uh, over HTTPS and also for those certificates to be trustworthy and pinned. So I spent a, a bunch of time working on that. Uh, right around this time, uh, people in, uh, in the Middle East became very interested in uh, sort of digital security uh, because they became more and more aware that uh, the, their efforts to organize were being spied on. And so I spent some time traveling all over the world, uh, teaching uh, people in vulnerable populations about privacy and security online. So I taught people um, you know, how, how to use end-to-end -end encryption tools, how to make sure that their you know, web traffic was not going to be spied on, how to maintain their anonymity online. And uh, the kind of advice that we were giving at the time can sort of be, um, you know, uh, summarized as uh, use Pigeon, use Tor. Uh, but it was actually much more complicated than that. And one of the big problems was that a lot of trainings were, uh, were entirely too simplistic and uh, weren't taking into account the way that, uh, that people were really using their tools. Um, and the stakes were very high. Uh, there was a journalist whose name was Andy Carvin who got uh, reasonably well known uh, for his reporting on what was going on inside of Syria at a time when Syria was closed off to journalists entirely. And so the way that he was getting his stories was by communicating securely with people inside of Syria. And uh, one day someone asked him, you know, so what, what tools do you use in order to communicate with your sources? Uh, are, are you using Skype? Are you using Tor? Are you using, you know, uh, are you using Pigeon? And uh, he replied that uh, he had all of his communication over Tor. And when asked why, he replied that everyone he knew who was not using Tor was dead. So 
this, this was very serious business. Uh, and as I was going around um, working with, uh, with all of these different groups, I started to notice that they were being targeted with malware. They were receiving uh, emails mostly because uh, at, this, at this time, malware was largely still uh, targeting people's desktops. They were receiving emails with sketchy attachments. And uh, I started collecting these attachments as sort of a hobby and uh, reverse engineering them. And um, I spent several years publishing, publishing reports about, uh, about what I found in there. So uh, I wrote about uh, malware that was used by the, uh, in Kazakhstan, that had been used by the government in Lebanon, that was being used by uh, the Vietnamese government. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Ocean Lotus as, uh, as an APT. Uh, and I, I spent several years working on this. Um, Again, one of the ways in which this really uh, related back to uh, the to the the thing that Threat Lab does uh, was that at the time, um, companies like Mandiant and CrowdStrike uh, and Kaspersky uh, were already publishing reports about APTs. You know, the the Mandiant's APT one report had already gone out. Uh, one of the interesting things about that report was that they really emphasized that, uh, that China was targeting journalists specifically and that uh, journalist organizations and newsrooms really needed to step up their game in terms of security, which, uh, which was really interesting. So a lot of money suddenly went into uh, journalist trainings. Uh, who got left out of that? Uh, usually freelancers. Uh, most journalists do not work for large organizations on salaries. They work freelance. And if you were a freelancer at the time, you were essentially left on your own to figure out your own uh, you know, digital security uh, workflow. And if you messed up uh, once more, you, you were just left out in the cold. There was, uh, there was no training for you and there was no help for you. So that was a very serious problem. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that EFF did in order to deal with that problem was we took all of these trainings that we did all over the world and uh, we took that information and we put it online. Uh, in fact, you can find it at Surveillance Self-Defense, uh, which is at ssd.eff.org. Uh, and we did... Um, a lot of things with our uh, privacy and security guides that other privacy and security guides were not doing. Uh, to begin with, we translated it into a bunch of languages. We uh, had uh, people read it and test it and let us know whether or not stuff was working properly. Uh, we updated our guide. Um, in 2013, I gave a talk at CCC in which I described the internet as sort of a graveyard of abandoned security guides. Uh, so actually keeping a security guide up to date is really hard, especially when every update that you make has to be translated into several languages. And EFF really put in, uh, put in the time into doing this. So around this time, we start seeing uh, we start seeing malware, and malware is targeting journalists, it's targeting activists, it's targeting dissidents, and it's not getting a lot of attention from the big security companies because it's not that sophisticated. Because we're we're looking at stuff from Iran and going, oh look, it's written in Delphi, uh, because it's using uh, you know our you know, RTF vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities in uh, you know. All kinds of stuff that that or flash for example uh, and you know this is 20 2012 2013 so it's not like we were we were short on vulnerabilities in flash uh, there we were not looking at a lot of new techniques in uh, in uh, phishing and malware we were mostly looking at, uh, at governments using extremely well-known techniques and so this wasn't very interesting to security researchers so they rarely wrote it up um, but if you were a uh, journalist or activist uh, in a place like Kazakhstan or Lebanon or Vietnam, uh, these were 
Um, these were attacks with very serious consequences. Uh, Vietnam has a long history of, uh, of targeting dissent and uh, jailing journalists and bloggers who are critical of the government. Uh, the uh, same goes for Kazakhstan, most definitely. Uh, Lebanon has, uh, has some very serious problems in the press freedom area. Uh, and so again, the, the stakes are high. Uh, and we started tracking uh, a couple of, uh, of APTs that were uh, sort of uh, pro-Assad hackers that were going after um, that were going after opposition uh, groups on Facebook, and that were going after uh, sort of prominent opposition activists. Uh, so I spent about two and a half years uh, writing reports about this. And again, uh, very few other people were writing these kinds of reports because the techniques were not novel. Uh, and so instead of focusing on, uh, on the technical end of it, I really focused on the people who were being, uh, who were being affected uh, because those effects are very real. Um, so I'd been doing this for a few years and uh, unfortunately, somewhere around the beginning of 2018, it came to light that uh, one of my research partners with whom I had done the majority of my research uh, was a serial rapist. So that was great. And uh, this came out in the press. Uh, there were a series of interviews with, uh, with uh, survivors and in 2018, I read an interview with a survivor in, uh, I think it was Vice. Uh, and what really struck me about this interview was uh, how scared she was and how scared everybody who was being interviewed was. Uh, they all had stickers over the, um, they had stickers over their cameras. They were really concerned about the security of their phones. And they were concerned about the security of their laptops. And the reason for this was that not only uh, you know, was this guy a, a reasonably famous hacker uh, who had sort of made his reputation by working on you know, fairly you know, high profile and sophisticated cases, but apparently he had also threatened them and said, you know, if you come out and you say anything, I, uh, I will hack your devices. So I was really mad. <laughs> And I, I did what I usually do when I get mad, which was that I tweeted. And in 2018, I tweeted that if you were a woman who had been sexually assaulted by a hacker and you were concerned about, uh, about your device being compromised, that you could reach out to me and I would make sure that your device would get a forensic analysis. And then I went to lunch or I went to sleep or something. I definitely ran off for a while, and when I came back, uh, the tweet had gone viral. Uh, it got something like 10,000 retweets, and I started hearing from people every single day. I was being contacted by dozens and dozens of people a day. And that's actually something that continues now in, in 2021. I have not worked on an abuse case since, oh, yesterday. So uh, people still come to me with this stuff. And it was an overwhelming number of people. I, I cannot emphasize how many people were, were knocking on my door. And it was very disturbing uh, and also exhausting. But I learned some really interesting stuff uh, from having worked with you know, dozens and dozens of uh, abuse survivors and people who are concerned about, their, uh, about the safety of their devices uh, every day for several years straight. Uh, to begin with, I learned uh, some of the same lessons that I learned talking to journalists and activists all over the world. And the first lesson is that uh, I uh, have always been wrong about what I think the problem is. When I start to approach a problem, uh, my, my first guess about how to solve it is almost always going to be wrong. Um, so what I started seeing in, uh, in the people who were coming to me uh, was that the problem usually was not device compromise. It wasn't usually stalkerware uh, installed on their phone. It was almost always account compromise. Uh, so 
again, one of one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest problems that I was seeing was account compromise, and you could get a lot of bang for your buck by teaching people how to lock down their accounts. Uh, the good news is that uh, a lot of research and a lot of work has already gone into teaching people how to create um, safe passwords, uh, unique and strong passwords, how to use a password manager, uh, and how to uh, enable and use uh, various levels of 2FA. Um, again, this was another area where I had to sort of deviate from, uh, from the orthodoxy because uh, on one hand, you uh, really don't want people to use uh, text-based, you know, SMS-based uh, 2FA if you can avoid it. Uh, but for many accounts at the time, SMS-based uh, 2FA was the only kind of 2FA available. Um, or I was dealing with people who were not comfortable using, you know, a YubiKey or uh, figuring out how, uh, you know, how Authy works. So uh, those were some very serious problems. And I really had to learn how to, uh, how to meet people where they are and get them the most security that I thought that they would actually use uh, rather than coming to them with, uh, with my sort of pre-baked ideas about what it is that they should do. The, uh, the sort of more recent equivalent of, you know, use Signal, use Tor, and then fly away. Uh, and that's something that I, I try really hard not to do. So I was wrong about a bunch of stuff. Uh, and uh, fixing account compromise could get us uh, really, really far. Um, Having said that, sometimes it really was uh, device compromise. And when it was, those cases were really disturbing. Those were often the cases that involved uh, stalking and harassment. Those were cases that sometimes involved physical violence, that involved kidnapping. Uh, I saw a lot of really disturbing stuff uh, that happened as a result of somebody installing uh, you know, spyware on someone's computer. One moment, my cat has decided that he has opinions. Okay, there we go. Uh, my cat will not be making a cameo in, uh, in this keynote, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps a little bit later. So where was I? Uh, we were, there was stalkerware. <laughs> there was stalkerware. Uh, so people's, uh, people's laptops were being targeted with stalkerware, and increasingly we were starting to see mobile malware and stalkerware for phones. And the reason for that is that uh, getting all of the information off of a phone, it gives you uh, an enormous amount of information about what a person is doing. Uh, you know, you pull all of their passwords and their you know, web browsing history and their photos and their you know, text messages and their end-to-end -end encrypted communications. And most importantly, they are carrying a tracking device around in their pocket, conveniently enough for you, telling you where they are at all times. So this stuff is uh, you know, a uh, bonanza of spying, uh, whether you are a government or an uh, abusive ex or some sort of harasser. Um, so my first thought when, uh, when I saw that, uh, that stalkerware was not the biggest problem, but definitely a, a problem linked to the, the most disturbing abuses that I saw, was that um, surely we have a way of detecting this stuff. I mean, that's what the AV industry does, right? You're supposed to install antivirus on your, uh, on your device, and then it's supposed to tell you if there's bad stuff on it, right? Uh, so I ran some tests. I did a little bit of research uh, back in, uh, I think it was 2018, and uh, I discovered that uh, antivirus was actually not very good at detecting, uh, at detecting even the most popular stalkerware. And I was really surprised. I had all kinds of theories about why this was, but really it came down to the fact that uh, most AV companies uh, shrugged it off. They, uh, they figured that there were, uh, sure, there were abuses, but they could imagine some legitimate cases 
uh, some legitimate uses for, for stalkerware, and therefore they thought that labeling it as, uh, as malicious uh, would be bad, and so they should err on the side of caution and just let stalkerware sit there undetected on people's devices. So the first thing that I did was I went to AV companies and I asked them to stop it. Uh, it is not very hard to stay on top of uh, what, uh, what stalkerware makers are doing. And that is because unlike APTs, uh, stalkerware companies sell their products. They sell them commercially. They, have, they make ads. Uh, and therefore, it's actually really easy to find them. Uh, it's very easy to purchase them, uh, unlike uh, the you know, companies like NSO Group uh, and, uh, and their products like Pegasus. You don't have to be a government. You don't have to be law enforcement in order to get your hands on this stuff. Uh, and so research is a cinch. You simply buy it and figure out what it's doing. Uh, and uh, that made my work so much easier. But it also made the work of, uh, of researchers at the different AV companies uh, much easier. And we've seen the AV companies have gotten much better at detecting stalkerware uh, across the board. Uh, there is a organization called AV Comparatives that uh, very that publishes a list of uh, of the different AV products every year and talks about how well they do at detecting stalkerware. Uh, the biggest stalkerware problem is definitely in uh, in the Android market. And uh, we've, we've really seen um, detection improve a lot. So I've been very excited about that. Uh, but there are uh, also some other recent developments. Um, for example, just uh, the day before yesterday, uh, in the United States, the Federal Trade Commission uh, announced that uh, they were issuing a ban on, uh, on a stalkerware company. They issued a ban on a company called Spyphone and uh, its parent company, uh, as well as its CEO, uh, telling them that essentially they, they have to stop doing business. Not only do they have to stop doing business, um, but they have to uh, reach out to everyone that had had their product installed covertly on their device and they uh, needed to alert them and let them know that they had been spied on. Um, so right now, the FTC is in a 30-day comment period during which uh, people can, can comment on, on the ban. Uh, but as the ban uh, goes into effect, I'm going to be very curious to see how things go forward. And one of the things that I'm most interested in seeing is uh, how many people end up getting these alerts and uh, you know what these messages look like. Uh, one of the reasons why the FTC went after Spyphone is the same reason that they went after a company called Retina X uh, a few years ago. And that is that not only do they make spyware, but they don't even make spyware very well. Uh, so both Retina X and Spyphone had had uh, some really interesting data breaches. So not only were they, you know, uh, allowing people to, you know, steal data, um, but then that data was left wide open on CNCs uh, where it could be stolen, uh, you know, many, many times over. Uh, and we've seen this happen many times. So again, the, the people who are making this, uh, this software are not very sophisticated, they're not very diligent, they're not particularly good at it, uh, and not only do they put the, uh, the people who are being spied on at risk um, because their data is being given to, uh, you know, to, to their stalkers, to their harassers, uh, to people with whom they are in abusive relationships, um, but it, they are also leaking that data to uh, to other potential malicious actors, and that is really problematic. Uh, one of the other interesting things that I have seen uh, in uh, recent months is that Apple came out with a new product uh, called the AirTag. Uh, so we saw a lot of uh, you know, spying by, uh, by uh, you know, abusive partners 
by covertly installing spyware on their um, on their computers or covertly installing spyware on their phones. Um, but sometimes uh, abusive partners are not in a position to compromise somebody's phone. Uh, perhaps they have an Android and some AV, and they're worried about you know the AV picking up uh, picking up the stalkerware. So uh, Apple conveniently came out with a with the AirTag, which is a uh, device about the size of a quarter, this big, uh, and it is designed to um, to be attached to your uh, uh, to your keys or to your wallet or something else that you are worried about losing. Uh, it uh, connects over, uh, over Bluetooth. It pairs with uh, your Apple ID with, um, with the AirTag. And what's particularly interesting about this is that when your AirTag goes uh, out of range of the phone, uh, you can consult your phone and it will tell you where the AirTag is located. Uh, so that is very useful. Um, Apple is not the first company to, to have made this particular type of product. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Tile, uh, but it is a, a very similar product that uh, has been out for many years. Um, however, what makes the Tile different is that uh, the Tile only communicates with uh, over Bluetooth with other phones that have the Tile app. Uh, installed on the phone. So there's a limited number of tiles out there. There's a limited number of tile apps out there. And uh, if you lose your uh, uh, something that is attached to the tile, uh, you may, you know, you know your, your lost item may go all day without coming within Bluetooth range of somebody with a phone with the tile app installed uh, in order to tell you where it is. Um, the way that Apple devices work uh, is different. So what Apple did was they decided that every AirTag uh, would talk to every iPhone. The iPhones would create a network uh, by default. Um, you actually have to uh, you have to go in and you have to go into Find My Phone and specifically opt out of this network if, uh, if you find it creepy and you don't want to contribute to it. Uh, and what that means is that when, a, uh, when a t uh, an AirTag is lost, when it goes astray, when it is, uh, say, left inside the, you know, a car belonging to someone uh, who is going through a messy divorce, um, then all the, the air tag needs to do is it needs to come within 30 feet of another iPhone. And going through the day without coming within Bluetooth distance of an iPhone is actually pretty difficult. And that means that the Apple tracking capabilities are much, much stronger than the tiles. This is why I was particularly concerned about the air tag. Um, now, not to be outdone, as soon as Apple announced the AirTag and I started yelling at them uh, for, for having created this thing, uh, Amazon uh, announced that they were entering into an agreement with Tile and they were going to try to uh, set things up so that every Tile would communicate with every Amazon Echo in order to increase the, uh, the size of its network to make it even better for spying. Um, I did manage to convince Apple to change some of the things that it was doing uh, it, uh, in order to mitigate the ability of, uh, of abusers to uh, you know, track people using their tools. Uh, one of the things that they had done um, that, that they were especially proud of was uh, that if a uh, if an air tag was out of uh, out of range of a phone for I think more than three days, it would start to emit a beep. So the idea was that this beep would uh, would alert uh, somebody who was being spied on. Uh, furthermore, if you had you know Find My turned on, it would uh, it, it would alert you that some you know some strange air tag is uh, is possibly following you. Uh, so. Those things were potentially useful. Uh, the, the alert was useful, but only if you have an iPhone. 
So if somebody with an iPhone was tracking somebody who had an Android, they had no way of getting the alert. And what they had to rely on instead of the alert was the beep. Um, unfortunately, the beep is not very loud. The beep is about 60 decibels, and I was able to silence it just by, you know, clenching my fist. Um, I was also able to silence it by leaving it between the cushions of a couch, um, by hiding it under the seat in a car, uh, by leaving it in a pocket, in a purse. Uh, it was actually really difficult to hear the beep. It was also possible to, um, to adjust the, uh, uh, the air tag in such a way as to make the beep even more inaudible. Uh, and last of all, if you were a person with a hearing disability or if you were deaf, um, then there was simply no way for you to hear the beep at all. Um, so one of the things that I got uh, Apple to commit to is that starting in, uh, or they're expecting that in December, uh, they will put out an Android app that will allow you to know whether or not there is an AirTag uh, which is tracking you uh, so that at least you have the same benefit with an Android that you do if you are not in the Apple ecosystem. And this is a particularly good example of, uh, of the kind of activism that I was talking about at the beginning of this talk, which is that um, when Apple put out the AirTag, they thought that they had done enough to mitigate the problem. Uh, they thought that they had already thought about the abuse case and uh, that they had solved it. Uh, and it turns out that wasn't the case at all. And the thing that they could not imagine was a person who didn't own an iPhone. Uh, they, their weakness was imagining uh, you know, people who existed entirely outside of their ecosystem. And uh, that's, that's really a... Um, one of those things where you know, threat lab thinking would have been extremely useful to them. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what you can do, uh, if the sort of everyday hacker uh, can do uh, to have sort of a threat lab mindset. Uh, the first is, of course, uh, most of the people here are you know, security professionals and do security research. And it would be great if more people looked at security research that impacted vulnerable populations. Everybody has a population that they care about uh, that other people are not paying attention to. Uh, everybody has groups of people that they know well and whose problems they understand that people in power are not building things for and that people in power are simply not thinking of. Uh, when you know white middle-class male professionals in an office in Santa Clara uh, build a tool, they often build it for people like themselves. And they don't imagine how it's going to be used by, uh, an, by a journalist in Turkey or an activist in Hong Kong or uh, by a soldier on an army base or a victim of domestic violence. And because they don't think of these things, uh, they don't make the correct mitigations. And the best way to sort of point out the flaws in, uh, in these tools is to, to do the security research and to publish it, to let everybody know about the kind of stuff that you're doing. Uh, the second thing that everybody can do is uh, that uh, everybody has uh, a, a group of people for whom they are tech support. Um, almost all of us go back to our families and you know, have people who ask us for privacy and security advice because we are privacy and security professionals. We are the people who should be able to tell you what password manager to use, what computer uh, you, you want to buy, uh, what kind of phone is secure. And uh, so learning how to give good advice is really important. Uh, and furthermore, beyond giving good advice, learning how to give good training is important uh, in your community. So uh, one of the things that I discovered by traveling all over the world and training activists and journalists is that information security professionals are terrible, terrible digital security trainers. We suck. And the reason for that is because we completely misunderstand uh, what the training is for. 
often what digital security professionals feel that training is for is that you get up in front of people and you demonstrate that you understand privacy and security concepts and you know what to do. So you get up in front of them, you tell them use these tools, use them in this particular way. And if you don't do it this way, you don't deserve privacy or security. Uh, this is a terrible way to teach because the people in the room simply aren't going to do the things you tell them to do because you are not giving them advice that works with their lives and all you're really doing is scaring them and being arrogant at them. Uh, so I spent a bunch of time learning how to teach uh, because it turns out that that's a very important skill. People regularly get master's degrees in this skill before they become teachers. Um, and uh, I worked with uh, others who have done trainings at EFF to distill that knowledge into a, what we call the Security Education Companion. Uh, and you can find that at sec.eff.org. And that's a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of tools and advice and handouts and charts that, uh, that you can use when you are giving security trainings uh, to, uh, you know, to new people or to vulnerable populations, um, or you know, you're, you're uh, teaching a class. Uh, so that stuff is also really useful. And there are you know, lengthy discussions of the sort of philosophy of teaching and uh, how to really meet people where they are and give them the advice uh, that they need instead of the advice that you think they need, uh, which was really one of the hardest lessons I had to learn uh, when I was doing this work. Uh, and uh, finally, you can go out and volunteer. Uh, for example, I uh, recently tweeted that an organization called SETA, uh, which is uh, at, um, at the... Um, at Cornell University in uh, New York is looking for volunteers for uh, providing um, security advice to uh, victims of domestic abuse. I, I think they're looking for, for people to volunteer about 10 hours a week. So that's something that everybody here can do and you can definitely make a difference. Uh, and uh, finally, the very last thing that you can do uh, is uh, join the Electronic Frontier Foundation. You can become a member. Uh, EFF is almost entirely funded by, or majority funded by uh, contributions from, uh, from individual members. We have more than 40,000 members all over the world. And in exchange for, uh, for your money and your love, uh, we will send you t-shirts and stickers. We are essentially a t-shirt and sticker company with a law firm and some engineers attached. Uh, so give us some love and we would definitely appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope to be able to answer questions uh, later this uh, what is morning for me and evening for you. Uh, and uh, now I think we will get to the Q&A. Thank you. So uh, we will start with questions aggregated by our crew. I will uh, read them to you and then we will adjust them one by one. So government officials and some people who are far from information security believe that it is impossible to protect citizens from terrorism or cybercrime without spying in the information collection with breaking human rights. What can you tell them? How to convince them that that's wrong? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, EFF worked with uh, dozens of other civil society organizations uh, to create uh, the uh, 13 principles of the application of, uh, of uh, surveillance. And let me see whether or not I can find the website. Principles of surveillance. There we go. Uh, they're called the Necessary and Proportionate Principles, and you can get to them at necessaryandproportionate.org. So these are the international principles on the application of human rights to communication surveillance. So not only have uh, a bunch of professionals in, uh, in civil society spent a bunch of time thinking about this issue, but we've got it down to just 13 bullet points of here's how you should do it. Uh, oh and you shouldn't do it. 
And I think that, that the was fast. Most, yeah, <laughs> we've, we've spent some time on this. Just Google it. <laughs> yeah, it's come up before more than nice. once. And I think that the Very most nice. important thing to know is that, again, uh, surveillance needs to be necessary and proportionate to the thing that you are trying to fight. Uh, you can't, if, if the government shows up and says, we need to be able to see everything all the time in order to protect you, that is neither necessary nor proportionate. That is not in line with the principles. So that starts right there. And I think yeah. the, the very first principle essentially says that mass surveillance is a, uh, is a violation of, uh, of all of our human rights, um, because mm -hmm. it uh, because it looks at everyone all the time, and that is extremely invasive. And there is uh, no danger, which is both necessary and proportionate, which justifies mass surveillance. And so that leaves us with uh, surveillance, which is more narrow in scope. And it's important to sort of rein that surveillance in as much as possible while still empowering the government to, uh, you know, do law enforcement or to do its job. But generally, when the government or law enforcement comes to me and says, we need more powers and we need to be able to see more stuff, I am immediately skeptical. Because essentially what they're telling me is they're incompetent. Uh, that's, that's what I also always answer to them. When they raise the topic, they uh, say, okay, we need this uh, aggregation of data in order to provide you safety. And I respond, no, you need that in order to do your work with less effort. <laughs> it's just more convenient for you. Yeah. Like all, all that they're telling me is that they're lazy or that they're not good at oh, their jobs. <laughs> yeah, lazy is a good word. I will use it from now on. Next, Eva, do you think uh, it is possible to consider that the Tor network is still safe to use. There are rumors that the same government agencies control the nodes now. So, uh, as with any question in information security, uh, the answer begins with a long and painful sigh, <sighs> followed by looking off into the distance and saying, well, it depends on your threat model. Uh, if you are using Tor, in order to maintain anonymity from government and law enforcement surveillance, which is targeted at you be specifically because you are breaking the law, uh, no, I would not count on tour. Uh, and part of the reason for that is uh, not so much that the government owns all the nodes, um, but that if you, uh, if any one party has a large enough uh, number of nodes or a large enough percentage of the nodes, then they can do a timing attack where they can correlate the traffic that goes in with the traffic that goes out, and they don't even need to know what's happening in the middle node. Um, right now, we are fairly certain that it's, it's not that all the nodes are owned by the U.S. government or all the nodes are owned by the NSA, uh, but it's possible that enough nodes are owned by certain types of law enforcement that I, I would not count on it if my life depended on. Um, having said that, there are all kinds of uses for, uh, for anonymous uh, browsing and anonymous internet use uh, in which your life does not depend. And uh, I think for that tour is often the appropriate tool. Oh, thank you for that, quite reassuring. Now we have a series of questions from uh, Alex, uh, who I believe is your biggest fan <laughs> because he has invited you. He was the author of this idea and uh, he wrote you that uh, you basically, your, your activity and your activism inspired a lot of his uh, professional career, uh, in particular his PhD thesis. So the first question from Alex is, what does EFF think about digitalization in Ukraine? Is it possible to keep privacy online with digitalization? Uh, have you heard about the DIA app? What are your thoughts about e-voting? So I started to uh, uh, put you into the context before we shifted uh, the live stream to the Q&A, uh, but just to give you more of the perspective. So DIA is basically the mobile app uh, and uh, some, some portion of its functionality is also a web portal that gives you ability to basically present yourself 
to uh, government officials because you can authenticate yourself with a QR code. They just scan it and they get uh, a request sent to some public um, registry that is already publicly available. But now we have just this uh, app. Yeah, we have the NAP for that. Uh, so it simplifies everything, but it also glues everything together. And maybe there is no... Uh, aggregation as such but there is now this central point of uh authority i guess right so this this point where everything is mediated and everything is routed through we have it now so this is what they call digitalization and uh, other social impacts and the political perspective they put it in i outlined to you uh, a bit earlier so what do you think about that I, I think that the primary risk of digitization is that when you have a single point uh, that everything is going through, you also have a single point of failure. And so you are extremely vulnerable to, uh, to DDoS. Uh, so I would be very concerned about that. And once you start having uh, mandatory use of the app, uh, or people become so reliant on the app that they don't have uh, other ways of identifying themselves, uh, then you start getting uh, really serious problems. So uh, I am skeptical. And uh, my primary concern is uh, both the mandatory use normalization and DDoS. Yeah, for sure. And considering our threat model, uh, yes, uh, considering your okay. threat model, I would say uh, DDoS is is uh, fairly high on the list. Yeah, yeah, there are people to the east that that are quite quite uh, that are following this progress with a lot of attention. They're providing you with free pen testing services. Yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks Very to vigorous if, if, pen testing. If they only provided us with the reports, you know, <laughs> they don't send us the reports. Which report. they don't. <laughs> Okay, so the second question from Alex is, you mentioned censorship. What about propaganda, fake news, disinformation? Does EFF have task forces for that? Uh, yes, EFF is actually very concerned about propaganda and misinformation. And uh, you, you would think that we would be, you know, as a, as a digital civil liberties organization that we spend a lot of time worried about, uh, about free speech, about making sure that you can express yourself online. And this is absolutely true. Uh, but one of the elements of free speech is acknowledging that if you just leave everything wide open with no moderation, then uh, the people without power will very uh, frequently get shouted down. They will, be, they will be harassed, they will be attacked, um, or you can launch uh, very effective misinformation campaigns as we have learned in, in recent years. Um, Having said that, we need to be really careful about the proposed solutions to uh, misinformation and content moderation problems. Because mm -hmm. frequently when we talk about content moderation, uh, people say, well, just, just take down the things that are bad. And you ask them, well, how do I identify a bad thing? And they're like, I know what a bad thing is. Take down the things that I think are bad. Because I am yeah. a perfect human being. <laughs> I am a perfect human being. The rest of you, on the other hand. So, uh, yes, this would be fine if I were queen of the universe and I decided what was good and bad. But that's simply not true. It turns out that these are not, uh, these are not objective facts. And so we start having a really hard time figuring out what you can and cannot take down and how. Um, so um, Platforms have tried to fix this by saying, well, just apply machine learning to the problem. And that only makes things worse because now the machines are deciding, now algorithms are deciding what is good and what is bad. Yeah. And what they do is they reflect existing biases. For uh, sure. and yes, there is a really fabulous organization called the Algorithmic Justice League that does nothing mm -hmm. but produce research on this. And it's really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, so what happens is uh, anytime that you hear a government or a platform say, oh, we're just going to solve this with machine learning, uh, what you should hear is, no, we're not going to solve this. Uh, this, is, this is not a solution. Uh, the solutions involve uh, giving a lot more uh, money to content moderation, having content moderation done by people who understand mm -hmm. the context 
uh, which again is something that doesn't happen on platforms very often, especially if your platforms are run in the United States. Uh, they're frequently, uh, the people who are making these moderation decisions uh, don't really understand the rest of the world uh, or yeah. the specific political situation or they don't have enough people who speak the language. One of the biggest mm -hmm. problems in, uh, in Myanmar a couple of years ago was that essentially uh, the, there were groups in Myanmar that managed to, you know, very successfully call for a genocide against the Rohingya, uh, which are a, a Muslim uh, sort of minority ethnic group. And the reason they were mm -hmm. able to do that is because there just weren't enough people in uh, in Facebook's moderation department who read Burmese. So they kept being told there is a problem, but there were not enough people who could even understand what the problem was, much less identify mm -hmm. the problem. They couldn't mm -hmm. read it, much less even understand what they were reading. Um, so yeah, way more money needs to go into content moderation and way more thought and, and subtlety needs to go into it. And we cannot fix it with machine learning. But to stay with that for a moment, uh, do platforms do anything related to applying machine learning to this problem? Because as far as uh, I know, there was a piece of news from Twitter or someone else where a... Why do I know it? Uh, because a graduate from a Ukrainian university was a winner of a contest that basically mathematically proved that machine learning algorithms uh, employed by Twitter are racially biased or something. Yeah? Surprise! So, they just reflect what we already know about ourselves. Absolutely. <laughs> they don't come from nowhere. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, all of the platforms have been trying to use machine learning in order to solve this problem for years. And mm -hmm. they have been doing a terrible job. And None because, of them failed, they're, yeah. Yeah, because they're not transparent about the algorithms that they're using or um, how they're using them, or even if they're using them, or what kind of experiments they're trying, mm -hmm. uh, it is really difficult to hold them accountable. Uh, of probability, yeah. Absolutely, and this is, this is a very serious problem. Uh, there are lots of academics who work on this issue right now, who are trying to understand the various uh, algorithms that are being used by the platforms. And the platforms are even working with academics saying, hey, help us come up with algorithms or experiments that we can run on, on this data set. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, relationships between the platforms and academics are really strained. Uh, because the platforms are interested in working with academics as long as they never really criticize their work or as long as mm -hmm. they are uh, silenced by NDAs and can never, uh, never talk about the things that they find, uh, which is really problematic. Yeah, yeah, all good points. So uh, with all that in mind, what uh, the next question from Alex is naturally, how do you envision... Uh, the global internet uh, in 10 or 20 years? Are we going back to pseudonymous and uh, not using real information? Or is it possible to have safe social networks? I think the- Digital so social I mean, networks for sure. All right, so obviously the internet is bigger than social media and thank God. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the, the, the safest prediction, the way to always look like a genius when you're making predictions is to say that everything will get better, but also everything will get worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, on one hand, I think that we are going to see uh, more efforts in the area of uh, protecting encryption and sort of ubiquitous end-to-end -end encryption. I think we're going to see greater rollout of uh, two-factor authentication, which really does a lot to protect uh, people's accounts. Um, I know that for people who work in information security, this is a no-brainer, but trying to get people outside of information security to both you know, use and implement a uh, strong two-factor authentication is, uh, is a whole universe of nightmares. Um, so there's that. But I think we're also going to see more efforts by governments uh, to, to circumvent this. We're going to see mm -hmm. more attacks on, uh, on journalists and on activists, on people who speak up to the government, on people who report on government corruption. Uh, and that's really just a continuation of a trend that we've already seen uh, with uh, essentially the impunity of people in power. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's also really worrisome. 
so I, I don't think I'm going to run out of work anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. And I hope uh, we won't run out of people capable and willing to speak up to the authority, to say the truth to people in power. Uh, okay, what's EFFs or your personal position about recent famous cases? Uh, this one we briefly covered, Apple's plan to scan photos uh, for child abuse imagery and uh, Facebook blocking NYU disinformation research. All right, well, uh, I think the my view on Facebook uh, blocking NYU disinformation research is already pretty clear. Uh, the, what Facebook is doing is ridiculous. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand why Facebook is doing it, um, but it's just blatantly self-serving. Uh, and uh, as for the Apple uh, don't, don't, I'm, so, I'm sorry, just, just to clarify, don't you see it as a, do, don't you give them benefit of a doubt? Maybe just it's a, it's a blip uh, caused by their lawyer's legalistic approach to, to do things. I think that it does not matter why they do it. I think it only matters, okay. only the end Fair result enough. matters. If, <laughs> okay. if in the end you have uh, entered into an agreement to, uh, to work with researchers to find out you know, how effective your algorithms are, and uh, in the end you just muzzle them and their research uh -huh. and you cut off their access uh, to, to the, the ways that they use in order to find out what the hell you're doing, uh, that's not right. <laughs> sure. Uh, so yeah, there's so there's that, and also uh, so the Apple CSAM uh, plan has had some recent developments, mm -hmm. uh, as as I was as I was telling you earlier today, uh, Apple has announced that they are pausing their plan to uh, scan for CSAM on uh, directly on uh, on iPhones in in the United States. Uh, I think that this is really good news. I was really despairing that the decision had already been made and it had been made at the executive level and therefore we were not going to be able to launch uh, an effective uh, sort of uh, protest. But mm -hmm. the public outcry has been really effective and I think that this is a reminder to everybody that collective action works. Um, we're not done. Uh, pausing the program is really only the beginning and we have to make sure that they're not just going to restart the program as soon as we stop paying attention. Um, but it is movement in the right direction. And uh, if they had been allowed to continue with, uh, with their plan uh, unopposed, that would have, uh, and it still might, lead to uh, device side scanning for all kinds of content uh, that has nothing mm -hmm. to do with CSAM, for political content, uh, for uh, content that violates uh, intellectual property laws. And uh, that is a dystopia that uh, I'm not here for. Yeah, let's wait and see if they remove that functionality from iOS. That well, fortunately, they haven't they haven't put it in yet. So uh, oh, it's already there. As far as no. I know, there there was uh, a guy who already like defuscated this part of the iOS uh, operating system. It's not activated well, yet. It's not working, okay. but it's already yeah. in there. So if it disappears, that would be like a final uh, good sign. <laughs> I see. I'm going to have to read some release notes. <laughs> uh, Will they put it into release notes? <laughs> I don't know. Let's find out. They, you know, okay. companies put all kinds of interesting stuff into release notes. <laughs> Let's wait and see. Let's yeah. be attentive. So, uh, fifth and the final question from Alex is: uh, Is the only way to restore privacy and cybersecurity uh, in educating web users? It's not the only way. I think it is very important. Uh, it's to, a suggestive question. Yeah. I would, I would, yeah. If I were yes, a lawyer, educating <laughs> educating users is really important. Uh, I absolutely of agree. Uh, but it's not the only method. The good news about activism is that we have all kinds of tools in our toolbox. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm most enthusiastic about when I go to hacker conferences is to talk to the people who are starting companies and who are making the information security. Uh, decisions at large companies and at startups and getting them to think about the needs of vulnerable populations from the very beginning and to think mm -hmm. about how their products are going to be misused by governments and law enforcement and people in power that they don't like. 
uh, down the line and to build things that are robust and that uh, protect themselves against abuse from the very beginning instead of just trying to add security on at the end. The best security that we can provide for end users is the, a level of security and privacy which is there by default. Uh, mm -hmm. So that people don't even see it, they don't even know that they have it, uh, and therefore they don't have to turn it on and they don't have to opt in. Uh, that is, I think, the, the most effective way of doing things. And the people who are at this conference are the people who are in a position to affect that kind of change. So true. Yeah. And we work hard. We work hard towards that. Uh, this is the general theme of our second day, I think. Yeah, put everything into architectural decisions, not uh, not optional user choices. Next one, imagine that everyone on the planet is aware about information security and the rights. Everyone starts to use Tor, secure messages, VPN, and so on. What's next? What's the next challenge? <laughs> oh man, there's still so much left to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Again, there's uh, there's still e-voting. There's still the problems with information security. There are still problems with misinformation. There are uh, still problems with the government overreach of uh, for your data. Uh, I'm never going to run out of work. Uh, end user security is only a very very small part of uh, the stuff that EFF is, uh, is worried about. Uh, when EFF was founded in 1990 and dinosaurs roamed the earth, uh, it was, um, we were an obscure little hipster organization. Our worries were, were considered to be niche. Uh, uh, but what's happened over the last 31 years is that uh, everyone's lives uh, have a digital component. Everyone has a life online. Everybody's information is online. And so all of the things that we worried about 31 years ago are, uh, that were obscure are now central to everybody's existence. Uh, and our issues are now very mainstream issues. Uh, you don't have to uh, point out that something is digital or point out that something is online. It is taken for granted that most things are, are digital. Most things are happening online. Uh, and when so much information is out there, uh, then protecting it becomes that much more important. And uh, really understanding how we treat it is also really important. Uh, so uh, no, EFF is never going to run out of things to do. Uh, pretty sure you won't. Okay, next one. How far can you, sh how far can and should? And again, a suggestion here, I feel a suggestion. How far can and should governments go in what we now have here in the Netherlands? Oh, Peter, hi again. In uh, or excluding people, including or excluding people based on the fact that they are vaccinated or not. So um, what's the extent of government regulations that you deem appropriate in uh, socially significant issues, I guess? Well, I'm not sure exactly how the Dutch government is implementing uh, vaccines or mm -hmm. vaccine requirements. So I'm not really qualified. Not enough to, data. Uh, I don't have enough data, but I can tell you that my colleague uh, Alexis Hancock has published several blog posts uh, on the EFF website about uh, vaccine passports and uh, why we should be skeptical of them mm -hmm. as, a, as a panacea. So mm -hmm. those are definitely worth reading. So it's not so much vaccine passports are all bad all the time, just uh, we, we should give it some side eye, we should be skeptical, and it's all, in the, um, uh, it's all in the details and it's all in the execution. As always, devil cries in the details. Next one. Do you have any partnership with organizations from Ukraine that protect human rights? What kind of I, coordination can help uh, to do their job? I've spent a lot of time working with individuals in the Ukraine and with journalists uh -huh. that cover uh, digital rights issues in the Ukraine. 
uh, and for that matter, uh, government corruption and all kinds of things that get them uh, the, the attention of the government, uh, but not with any uh, formal nonprofit organizations inside of the mm-hmm. Ukraine. Uh, if there mm-hmm. are any at this conference that are listening, you can email me at eva at eff.org. Please, please do that. Everyone who is uh, watching this live or on record and you're concerned with human li- rights uh, in the digital world, please get in touch with Eva. Next one. How do you assess the chances in the fight against governments in 10 years? Will the whole world not be similar to today's China? Social rating, re- recognition of faces, uh, and so on. What else do you think can be done to prevent such inclinations from governments? A very politicized question. I will understand if you skip that. I I understand why people ask these questions. I mean, it's essentially, hey, me, are we me headed too. for dystopia? I just give you a safe way out if you yeah. don't want to answer. <laughs> uh, are we headed for dystopia? A little. Um, I yeah. If I believed that it was not possible to stop dystopia, uh, I wouldn't be a professional activist. <laughs> I, I think that collective action is really powerful and that framing the issues in ways that are compelling uh, to people and that help them understand why their rights are important and what they can do about it, what concrete steps they can take uh, is mm-hmm. really essential. Uh, for example, uh, Apple had this terrible plan to go and mm-hmm. scan for CSAM directly on our devices, leaving our devices vulnerable to all kinds of requests for scanning uh, by uh, governments and law enforcement all over the world, especially in China where iPhones are manufactured and Apple is really not in a position to just tell them to bugger off. So mm-hmm. um we managed to to fight that to a standstill this morning. I think that that is a really significant achievement. And it would not have happened if people hadn't spoken out, if they had not uh, written to Apple, if they had not written op-eds in newspapers uh, and made it clear that they're reconsidering the purchase of Apple devices. Uh, collective action is uh, is really one of the only things uh, that makes a difference. And that is why it's so important for us all to work together. We are well beyond the cybersecurity <laughs> topics already. So this one will not surprise you. Uh, at our university uh, where I work, we have a student who is uh, in Afghanistan now. Is EFF somehow involved in helping the people of Afghanistan? Um, I don't know. I, uh, I used to work on EFS international team and I don't right now. I can tell you that we've been in a hurry to translate uh, parts of surveillance self-defense uh, into Pashtun, uh, mm-hmm. which is the language spoken and read by most people in Afghanistan. So mm-hmm. uh, in that sense, yes, we have been doing some work. Um, I personally, outside of EFF, have been down, uh, have been donating lots of money to refugee re- uh, relief funds. And mm-hmm. the reason for that is that I, uh, I came to the United States as a child, as a refugee. And I think it's really important to, uh, to support uh, refugees all over the world. And people in Afghanistan are, uh, are in a lot of danger. And it is literally the least we can do <laughs> to help them get out. Yes, indeed. Okay. On this note, I think we have run out of questions, which was huge. Thank you very much. This is like, I don't know, it's a new personal best for non-imcon closing keynote. Uh, We only have one remark here. It's uh, a lot of cheering them. I'm wondering how I didn't know all this for so long. Uh, Really, it's like watching a spy agent movie. Thanks for putting this. Uh, as closing keynote loved this so much uh thank you too for the positive feedback eva it was uh, a huge pleasure i think for us all to have you as a special closing keynote this was uh, very refreshing and uh a little bit depressing but this news about apple that you broke 
out to us. Uh, this this was a positive note, and we think that uh, it's an argument. You know, it, it's a fact that proves that collective activism works, and uh, we have to bear some optimism in the future with us and look uh, look 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 into the future with uh, with the collective optimism because only with that optimism we could go on our activism right and we all wish you good luck in that and everyone who wants to join this effort please get in touch with eva Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope that uh, that one year, uh, perhaps even next year, we can all meet up in Ukraine. Oh, that would be very, very nice. Yeah, yeah. The, the pleasure would be ours. And uh, we hope to meet you in person one day and have uh, another exciting talk and discussion on one of our traditional conferences that might, might be outnumbered by non-traditional next year, but we all hope for the best. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, good luck. Thank you.